I think all of us are familiar with the words here on the screen. Words not written by Hippocrates, but never more important than today. I'm giving you a director's perspective, a little bit on what makes a good fellow, but perhaps more on what makes a great doctor. In infectious diseases, I think our hallmark is professionalism. I've listed a number of aspects of professionalism here. I want to go through them, not with an example of each one, but at least a comment about each. One is respect for the people we work with. And often you think that means respect for fellow physicians, but it goes well beyond that. It's respect for telephone operators, respect for nurses, respect for volunteers. People are doing their best. Many people don't have our training and discipline. And it is up to us to set the standard with respect. If you treat someone with respect, you'll earn their respect and be treated well. Secondly, compassion. I don't think you should ever see a patient without asking yourself, what would I feel like with this diagnosis? What would it be like if you just got told you had candida endocarditis or a myelodysplastic disorder? What cascade of emotions would you feel? And think about how powerless that patient must feel. Third, we must display integrity. We always want to be truthful in our words and our actions. We want to stay true to our goals. We want to acknowledge error. When there's a, a problem that we run into, it's always easier to explain right away where things went wrong. I made a mistake because of this and this. Our almost magic words in medicine. More and more hospitals are realizing as well that acknowledging error is very important with the patient. I myself have made many errors caring for patients, and I've never had a patient upset with me when I told them the truth. I want to talk a bit about responsible behavior. One of the keynotes of being responsible is that of follow-through. It is absolutely essential that when we tell a patient we're going to do something, or a colleague, or a coworker, that we follow through and do it. If you're not going to do it, don't say it. A quality physician, a professional physician, is also resilient. Resilience is thought to be very one of the five primary character traits, but it's important that we hone this in us. Many of us will make mistakes as doctors. Many of us will bury patients because of it. If we have truly thought things through and be careful, our feelings about this should be sadness, but they shouldn't be guilt. Remember, we only feel guilty when we've done something wrong. If we do it by the book and the patient doesn't survive, it's a time for grief, but not really a time for blame. It's important that we recover from unhappy events caring for patients and bounce back to being our professional selves. We want to use our resources to help patients, attendings, other residents and fellows. And these resources can run the gamut from a, a, an iPhone that you can readily identify pills with, to showing how, someone how to do a literature search, to using whatever unique resources you have. It might be computer skills, you might be widely read in the literature. You may have insights into the lab. All of these should be shared readily and never kept back. We should never play the game gotcha with our coworkers. We always want to display our resources up front and use them. We want to educate people. Doctor in its original sense means educator. We want to take pride in our teaching ability because the best patient is a learned patient. 
We need to teach them not just about their disease, but oftentimes suggest to them appropriate internet sites or other sources to read about their illness. We must be energetic. No one wants a tired, worn-out doctor. No matter how overworked we are, we always want to be fully charged. We always want to display uh, energy in front of patients and other doctors. We want to be very positive. We want to be engaged. And this could be active listening. It could be sitting there and listening to a patient tell their story. But we always want to know what's going on. Many times during rounds, even during a, an important discussion, I'll see someone's eyes drift to a television or thinking about something else. Uh, they themselves are losing an educational opportunity, and you can gently guide them back into the conversation. We want to be accurate when we give someone information. Precision is important in medicine and in speaking. When we tell someone something, if we really don't know the percent, it's better to just give a rough figure. Or you can always say, I don't remember, I'll look it up, but then be sure to look it up. Finally, we want to have current content knowledge. I think doing a fellowship is all about evidence-based medicine, probably all the medical education is. We really need to know the current literature. We need to know how to access it. And we must have a facility to obtain it, or we call it on short notice. When we work with patients and other doctors, some people we connect with, some we don't. Some patients readily follow a physician's orders, others are very non compliant. Much of this is probably attributable to class. Ruby Payne and uh, uh, Dr. Florida have done an excellent job describing class in America. They talk about a lower, middle, upper, and creative class. The lower class have an 850-word verb word vocabulary, usually use nonverbal communications, and you see that Unfortunate members of this class on shows like Jerry Springer, Cops, etc. People that live very much in the present. Uh, it's generational. They discourage education. And because they can't own things, they don't read, they don't have steady jobs, they own people. The middle class is defined very much by the attitude towards money. Uh, the middle class often equates success with money and are very egalitarian in their attitude about physicians. They often think that one physician is as good as another and they often don't understand the need for subspecialists. The middle class often brands themselves. For instance, I'm a buck, uh, or I'm a Bow Sox fan, or I only wear Tommy Hilfiger. The upper class is defined by power, and you get into that by birth. The upper class are usually not a problem for physicians, and that these individuals tend to be very well educated and very interested in their health. The creative class characterized by physicians, artists, lawyers, architects, are interested, are defined as success being virtuosity or doing a job perfectly. When speaking, the creative class often uses a formal register and then after determining a patient's social class, you can change your speech patterns accordingly. This ability to recognize class helps us interact with the patients and helps us understand what's important for them and how many times we have to repeat it. In my experience, this is especially evident in research trials. 
where you find you created an upper class that are very eager to participate. The middle class has mixed emotions about it. And the lower class has a almost paranoid reluctance to be a victim because of most of those social transactions they're taking advantage of. So that group takes special reassurance. When we approach a patient, we want to stop, look, and listen. Look at the patient, see who's in the room with them, make sure you introduce yourself properly to their guests. You want to generally look at the patient to get an idea of their health and listen to what they have to say. When you introduce yourself, use your preferred name slowly. Don't be afraid to repeat it. And if it's an odd name like mine, Senate, I ask them to repeat it back to me. I always try to conduct my interviews at eye level. And it's important to avoid yes or no questions, open-ended at best. I always kid about doctors that walk in and say to the patient, you don't use drugs, do you? Obviously, the answer is going to be no. Appropriately, you should say, when is the last time you got high? When asking about alcohol, you want to ask them, not do you drink, but do you drink three hard drinks a day or 12 hard drinks a day? And let the patient deny their alcohol consumption. Finally, I think it's important to find a topic of mutual interest. The patient will be easier to remember. I'll always remember one individual whose father was a zookeeper in Khartoum in Sudan and a zoologist, or another individual whose business was flying small planes across the Atlantic. It's far easier to remember patients by their interests than by their illnesses. And when I demonstrate taking a history, I always demonstrate having a person at eye level, engaging them in conversation, and using open-ended questions. Yes or no questions are reserved for very simple topics about allergies, etc. When asking about gender identity, you'd say some people prefer men, some women, some people, some of you. What do you prefer? For instance, when asking about gender identity, you'd say some people prefer men, some prefer women, some prefer some of you. When talking to the patient, you must show interest. You hear again active listening, leaning forward, put your papers aside, let the patient tell their story. Display a positive attitude. Don't show that you're rushed or stressed to a patient, even though many times you are. See if you have a commonality of interests. Sports and literature in two very neutral areas the patients will often help identify you with as well as you them. Be sure to show empathy. You should always tell a patient, I'm sorry you're sick. I'm going to do my best to make you better. Ask about their family. Be sure before you leave that you always make a simple point to the patient. They might be getting better or worse, but frame it in terms of patient welfare. Have the patient repeat it back to you. Always, before you leave, look how you can help before you ask how. You can. The ACGME, the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, has looked at six general competencies patient care, medical knowledge practice-based learning and improvement, interpersonal communication skills, professionalism, and systems-based practice. You can reference these further at their website or from your own ACGME office. They're fairly self-explanatory, but there's something each of us should excel at. 
This is an example of professionalism. This is from the American Board of Internal Medicine Evaluation. As you look at this, each of you should think, do you do this? Are you committed to self-assessment? Do you acknowledge errors? Recently, it seems that there's less physician autonomy. And Krauss talks about this in his book, The Death of Guilds, published by Yale University Press. In it, Dr. Krauss talks about medicine interacting with the state and also with capitalism. Pivotal events being the Medicare and Medicaid Act and managed care, both of which to some degree come between the patient and the doctor. We're told how to practice by some, how not to practice by others. We have to make sure that we're always the patient advocate and we cut through some of these red tape issues and we don't complain to the patient. I think one issue that I have the most difficulty with is it becomes more difficult for the doctor to maintain independent professionalism and their moral identity in the face of these temptations of capitalism and the intrusion of third-party payers. This very practice of medicine is being transformed by social and economic forces, all seeking to impede the doctor-patient relationship, it seems. An example is it, the HIPAA regulations, in which it seems an insurance company can know everything about a patient, yet I can't talk about a patient with a fellow physician. Dr. Levinson wrote an essay in 1976 about the self-contradictions of a humane profession. He was at Columbia University. He wrote that the sad paradox is that a profession supposed to care so much for people has somehow forgotten to care for and nurture its own. I think these words are very true. How often have we seen another physician distressed having problems with alcohol or marriage or both, or with their practice. How often have we not reached out to them and see what we could do? How often have we not suggested counseling or just been supportive? I think we define our profession and our own personal successes by our ability to talk with the troubled physicians. I want you each to remember that you are part of a great profession. I want you to each understand that you must get personal satisfaction from what you do. I want you each to let others see your professional satisfaction. I want each of you to embrace lifelong learning. No one should know more about your medical specialty than you do. To do that, make sure you know how to read a journal. I want each of you to never give up, to always do your best for your patients, and always be a patient advocate. Thank you very much. It has been my honor to talk with you.